Well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 50th Annual uh, Administrative Law Symposium. I'm Farah Vera, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Duke Law Journal. Thank you all so much for coming out here and spending your Friday and your Valentine's Day with us. As I've told our editors, we scheduled this on Valentine's, not for scheduling constraints, but because there's nothing more romantic than administrative law. Uh, but as a journal, we have truly really valued that we have done this for the last 50 years. We valued that institutionally, we are the leaders in administrative law scholarship, and we are so delighted to share that with you all today. Uh, of course, there are a lot of thank yous in store. Dean Abrams has a few very specific thank yous that she will provide. Um, as a few general ones, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, our panelists, our authors, the editors of the Duke Law Journal, and of course, Chelsea, who has done a fantastic job organizing all of this. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Abram. Thank you so much, Farah, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, this really is one of the premier annual symposia in the country, um, and I knew about it well before I came to Duke Law School to become dean, because once I actually got invited to come, and that was a, that was a big compliment. Um, so I'm really, really delighted to get to introduce our 50th anniversary of this symposium. Um, as, as Farah said, a lot of people put in a lot of effort uh, to make this happen, and I wanted to, to specifically thank a few people to our faculty who uh, proposed and then helped to uh, shape this symposium, especially Chris Walker, Emily Bremer, and Kent Barnett. Thank you for, for bringing us this idea for, for the shape of a symposium about charting the new landscape of administrative law. Um, thank you to uh, Stuart Benjamin, who has been a stalwart advisor to this, this uh, journal for many years, and as an administrative law uh, teacher and scholar himself, um, gives shape to these symposia. Uh, to all the students, uh, to Christy Compost for her, her staff assistance, and I, I, just, I know we just said this a minute ago, but I can't say enough that, um, that, that there always is a student who really takes the lead on making something happen. And, a lot of the law journal jobs uh, are very clear on their face what they are. Editor-in-chief, you know what you're doing. You know, lead articles editor, you know what you're doing. Special projects editor, you may not, not completely know what that's going to entail. Um, and Chelsea has just done a fantastic job of, of putting all this together, so thank you. Um, one of my uh, great privileges today is to get to introduce our first speaker. And this is a really special occasion because our speaker um, helped to shape the very first version of this uh, administrative law symposium when, when he was a student uh, at Duke Law School. Uh, Randolph May, known as Randy May, um, is our alumnus, both of, uh, I believe, Trinity uh, College and Duke Law School. Um, and he has been a leader in administrative law during his entire career. Um, he has worked at multiple law firms um, at, in communications, administrative, and regulatory law. Um, he's worked in government service, um, having been the assistant general counsel and associate general counsel at the Federal Communication uh, Commission. And he's also uh, started and participated in numerous think tanks and other organizations, um, including a stint as senior fellow and director of the Communication Policies Study at the Progress and Freedom Foundation, which was a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, and then his current position as founder and president of the Free State Foundation. Um, and so I hope we're going to hear today uh, from, from Randy May about both his career and the, his experience of, of helping to, uh, with this symposium um, in its infancy. So thank you, and please welcome our alumnus, Randy May. And I'm not stealing your speech, right? You, okay. I've walked away with people's speeches before. So. Don't, don't do that in this case. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, to Dean Abrams uh, for that introduction, and uh, thanks to Chelsea uh, and uh, Vera and all the student uh, members of the Law Journal and all of you here today. Uh, so first, I want to give a shout out to Vera Vera. I think I've pronounced that right. I'm not always good with, with names, but, uh, you know, it was just about three days ago. I think when my wife was sitting at the kitchen table uh, before she got to the crossword puzzle, 
which is usually the first order of business. But all of a sudden, he said, Randy, aren't you going to be speaking at a Duke Law event this weekend? And I said, yes, it's true. And she said, I'm reading this article in the Washington Post about the editor-in-chief of the Duke Law Journal, who is one of 16 women heading up, you know, as editor-in-chiefs of the leading law journals in the United States. You know, 16 women leading these, and that includes, of course, your own uh, uh, Farah. And but not only uh, was she leading, is leading one of these journals. But uh, according to the article, I don't think it was fake news, any of this. Uh, according, according to the article, Farah uh, was the person that, that discovered, uh, discovered the fact uh, that there are these 16 women uh, and organized uh, and maybe is in the process of organizing a special journal issue. So uh, congratulations to you and to uh, uh, show you how far uh, we've come in 50 years. When, when I was uh, in my class, there were four uh, women students. One of them happened to go on to be a Supreme Court Justice of, of Utah, uh, Christine Durham. Uh, so it, they were remarkable women then. Uh, congratulations to you. Uh, that's terrific. Okay, while by no means do I wish to suggest any real equivalence here, thinking about this symposium, this week called to mind, at least a bit, the period in the 1990s when my father first began to reminisce openly about his World War II service a half century earlier. To me, a quarter century ago, when I was in my late 40s, there was something somewhat hard to fully grasp about looking back a full 50 years, and there still is. You know, I know the saying, time flies, is trite, but to the Duke Law Journal students here today, and anyone here today that, uh, you know, is under 40 or so, just trust me, it does, okay, time flies. So now, looking back almost 50 years, I'll acknowledge that my own work on the Administrative Law Symposium, what initially we simply called the Administrative Law Project, that's the way uh, we referred to it, was a labor of love, but truth be told, reaching back now into the somewhat misty recesses of whatever part of my brain holds the memories of my law journal days, it's just as easy to recall the labor as it is the love. In just a moment, I'm going to turn to relating the story of the origin of the symposium and its evolution to what is universally acknowledged today, that the annual issue is a highly anticipated source of important and impactful administrative law scholarship. But first, a personal note, and uh, Dean Abrams uh, uh, kindly mentioned uh, some of this, but for me, working on the administrative law issue as a journal staff member sowed the seeds for what became deep roots in the administrative law field. For many years in private practice, and when I served as Associate General Counsel at the FCC, my principal focus was communications law, then and now a bottomless wellspring of administrative law. And since the founding of the Free State Foundation in 2006, a think tank focusing heavily on communications law and policy Administrative law has remained central to my work. Moreover, I've been privileged to serve as chairman of the ABA's Section of Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice, a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, as well as now a senior fellow of the Administrative Conference. Some things you see just come with living long enough. Uh, and, a, and a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration in Washington. So my own labor on the Administrative Law Project did indeed spur a lifelong love of ad law, which over the years has enabled me not only to benefit from and enjoy professional and personal relationships 
with some of those here today on the program, but also with very many scholars who have graced the pages of the journal issues over the last half century. But now back to the genesis of the symposium. A statement introducing the first administrative law issue, signed merely the editors, announced, quote, the journal initiates a major project designed to produce an annual commentary on each, each year's major developments in the field of administrative law, close quote. You know, I actually have uh, with me the, the uh, first issue, which I've had, uh, you know, all this, this half century. Uh, the, the, that's the same one. So it's worth quoting a bit more from the statement uh, to provide context for appreciating the early history and subsequent evolution of the administrative law issue. Quote, our first survey is organized according to the framework of the Administrative Procedure Act, and each discussion attempts to relate to that central procedural scheme, even though the, that act does not govern all of the situations involved. An obvious deficiency of the first survey is the inadequate treatment of new legislation and agency rulemaking, and we have established procedures which hopefully will improve this aspect of our second survey. But the editors, as I will refer to them throughout, acknowledge the role Leo Ward, apologies if I'm mispronouncing his name, then dean of the Santa Clara Law School, the role that he played in initiating the project, and but for his untimely death, he was scheduled to join the Duke Law faculty uh, the very next year. Uh, but the editors also acknowledge the role played by Duke Law professor Ernest Gellhorn. Now, Ernie Gellhorn later became a close friend of mine and colleague on various ad law endeavors, especially in the American Bar Association administrative law section. And his untimely passing in 2005, when I was serving as chair of the administrative law section, was a tremendous loss for the entire ad law community and legal profession. I could give a whole series of lectures about the contributions of Ernie Gellhorn, and of course, I'm not going to do that today, but I wanted to mention him because he, he was at Duke when I was here at the law school, and he was a real, real major force in administrative law. So now, uh, the journal's executive officers for the inaugural issue were William Sumner, George Krause, James Hassan, William Reamer, William Stevens, David Wyckoff, Jeffrey Lappick, and John Dawson, all of whom I can see right now in my mind's eye, just like it was yesterday, and all of whom collectively deserve credit. But above all, my good friend Jim Hassan deserves special acknowledgement and thanks. In the masthead of the first issue, Jim's title is listed as comment and project editor. <clears throat> Chelsea, there had never before uh, in the history of the journal been a project editor. Uh, so Jim's you know, title uh, changed and, and he was project editor. And I can assure you, with regard to Jim, the addition of project editor was by no means a case of honorific title creep. In reality, it meant that Jim, more than any other person, assumed the overall responsibility for ensuring that the editor's aspiration became a reality. In preparing the forward for the symposium issue, the print version, uh, I spoke with Jim twice to dig deeper into the project's origin and the editor's mindset and what is revealed in the inaugural statement. According to Jim, a primary impetus for introducing the project was to make the still young DLJ, remember the law journal was 20, 20 years old at that, at that point, distinctive in some way. After doing due diligence, 
it was determined that while various law reviews had staked out different fields, such as criminal law or constitutional law for publication of annual surveys, for the most part, other journals were not focusing on administrative law. What's more, the editor surmised, with Ernie Gellhorn's reinforcement, Jim said, that administrative law was on the cusp of becoming dramatically more impactful as the number of federal agencies and their responsibilities expanded. Well, they got that right, the expansion of the administrative agencies. So in the very first three annual issues, these seminal decisions, along with many other notable ones, were addressed in the student-authored developments section. <clears throat> NLRB v. Wyman Gordon, which discussed the discretion of agencies to choose adjudication or rulemaking to establish new policy. Goldberg v. Kelly, a case about the due process requirements applicable before terminating welfare benefits. Association of Data Processing Organizations v. CAMP, which addressed standing to seek judicial review. Citizens to Preserve Overton Park v. Volpe, which examined the adequacy of judicial review of agency action under the APA. So if you've had an administrative law uh, here at Duke, uh, you've probably encountered these decisions, which really are landmark decisions. And of course, there were, as I said, other notable ones. But it's only fitting that this uh, year, this symposium, 50 years after the inaugural issue, devoted nine pages to discussing the Wyman-Gordon case that the topic this year is charting the new world of administrative adjudication, because after all, that was what Wyman-Gordon, in part, was all, all about. So notably, the first development survey was organized, as the editor's statement promised, quote, according to the framework of the Administrative Procedure Act, close quote. And this was true in the two succeeding issues as well. Moreover, students authored the entire development section of each volume, 171 pages discussing 43 different decisions for volume 1970, 169 pages and 49 decisions for volumes 1970, excuse me, volume 1971, and 214 pages discussing 53 different decisions for volume 1972. That's a lot of topical developments covered each year under a tight schedule. There's no doubt that the hard work by the journal's student staff that went into producing those early surveys got the project off to a solid start. In the inaugural issue, uh, there's a note that expresses appreciation to Pike and Fisher for pro providing a complimentary subscription to Administrative Law Second uh, publication. I'm sure, I don't know when they stopped doing that. I don't think they're doing it anymore, but uh, when I was here, that was an important source of administrative law decisions. So we thank them for uh, giving us that complimentary uh, description. And I still have nightmares, well, at least bad dreams, of regularly getting the slip opinions in the mail hurriedly reading them to assess a case, case's significance and trying to match what I thought might be an opinion worthy of analysis to the proper APA section. Because remember, in the, in the early issues, they were organized according to the APA sections. By the way, for the benefit of Matt Weiner, the vice chair and executive director of the administrative conference, who's with us today here. Uh, I should mention that the inaugural issue discussed ACUS recommendation number nine. I'm not sure, Matt, whether you know what number nine dealt with, uh, but it had to do with <clears throat> the application of sovereign immunity to the actions of agency administrators. And that was one of the first of many references to administrative comp 
conference recommendations and succeeding issues. So perhaps not unexpectedly, the format of the ad law issue uh, has been a work in progress. So by the fourth volume, the journal abandoned the more structured APA organizational format, never to be resurrected. Now, you know, I say that based on the fact that in preparing for this symposium, I, I did go back and, and really look at a lot of these succeeding issues. Uh, so I believe that statement is, 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 uh, is true. The student-authored material <clears throat> placed variously under the headings of notes and recent developments addressed a disparate set of topics in the administrative law realm, focusing only partially on cases decided in the prior year. One of the notes, however, was named Developments Under the Freedom of Information Act, 1972. Remember, this is the fourth uh, ad law symposium issue. And for the next 18 years, the prior year's FOIA, Freedom of Information Act developments, were surveyed under that same heading. So thus far, I have focused on the student contribu contributions, which of course have continued to this day. After all, the Duke Law Journal is a student-run law journal. I might just say by way of a footnote that if you get a chance in the, in the 50th issue of the Law Journal, uh, if, if you take a look, Robinson Everett, one of the most beloved professors uh, here at Duke, he wrote a, a, a very nice forward which paid tribute to all of the uh, student editors over the, over the years. Uh, so we, we talked about the student contributions, uh, but of course the Ad Law Symposium uh, aimed from the outset to attract important articles from prominent scholars <clears throat> and occasionally from accomplished practitioners. In other words, to publish not only scholarly works, but ones that address the practical applications of such developments for agency officials, private practitioners, and of course affected members of the public. Were you to spend any time at all, as I have, combing through the 40-some administrative law issues that followed those first ones, I'm confident that you'd agree the editor's initial ambitions have been realized and then some. Given the time constraints, I content myself here with a few necessarily selective observations and examples. Within the first decade, the symposium had attracted articles from D.C. Circuit Chief Judge David Bazelon and leading scholars Paul Vercal, Charles, excuse me, Charles Koch, Sid Shapiro, Hal Bruff, and, a, and of course, Ernie Gellhorn. As the years went by, the roster of prominent authors continued to grow. So again, only by way of illustration, take the 20th issue in 1989, which included articles by the late Justice Scalia. That was his early post-Chevron, much-cited article, Judicial Deference to Administrative Interpretations of Law, and by Cass Sunstein, Dick Pierce, and Peter Strauss, those were all giants in the field, or giants in the field of administrative law. I take the 22nd issue, uh, which included important articles by D.C. Judge Patricia Wald. That article was the new administrative law with the same old judges in it, and by scholars Christopher Edley, Marshall Brager, Cynthia Farina, Jerry Mashal, and Cass Sunstein in one of his multiple appearances. Put a fine point on it, the very next year, the 23rd issue, so note that I'm talking about issues here that were very close in time, uh, all within four years. Uh, 23rd issue featured a lineup of Robert Anthony, Thomas McGarrity, Peter Strauss, Don Elliott, and Ron Levin, all very prominent scholars. Bob Anthony's article, Interpretive Rules, Policy Statements, Guidances, Manuals, and the like, Should Federal Agencies Use Them to Bind the Public? That's a, that's a long title for a law review article, right? <laughs> that article examined the proper classification and practical consequences of the type of agency actions 
often referred to as soft law, Tom McGarrity's some thoughts on deossifying the rulemaking process examined the increasingly procedural laden, analytically burdensome notice and comment rulemaking process and the practical consequences of converting what the APA envisions as a relatively informal rulemaking process into a heavily formalistic one. Both of these articles, among the most cited and influential in administrative law scholarship, became instant classics, spurring fresh thinking about how agencies could be more transparent, accountable, effective, and efficient. And after all, that's what administrative law is all about. By any measure, these lineups of Avlaw All-Stars are difficult to top in three close-in-time volumes. And the prominence of the authors, which the Avlaw issue attracted early, has never abated. Now, I want to highlight, uh, again, out of necessity, only highly selective, selectively a few of the special symposium issues focusing on particular subjects. The 19th issue, 1988, was devoted to Quote, the independence of independent agencies, a subject as topical today as it was in 1988. That volume was notable for contributions by Dick Wiley, former FCC chairman, and Jim Miller, former FTC chairman, as well as Alan Morrison, then director of the Public Interest Litigation Group, a frequent challenger of a variety of agency actions. In other words, it included the views of very prominent experts with firsthand practical experience earned in the trenches. Even so, their contributions in that issue were accompanied by the usual scholarly pieces. For example, another of Paul Verkal's off-cited classic articles, The Purposes and Limits of Independent Agencies. The 30th uh, and 35th issues exemplify ones focused on topics on the cusp, cusp of producing potential paradigm shifts in administrative law domains. The 30th issue, titled Governance of the Internet, addressed foundational questions regarding the emerging law of cyberspace. The 35th issue, styled The Role of the Internet in Agency Decision Making, examine the way in which the internet could change agency rulemaking practice. Duke Law School's own Stuart Benjamin, uh, Stuart, thank you for all of your contributions to the journal, uh, then and now, uh, led off with evaluating e-rulemaking, public participation in political institutions, and Kerry Conglianese, another very prominent rulemaking expert. Uh, Kerry contributed citizen participation in rulemaking past, present, and future. Alas, given more time, I could give countless other well-deserved shout-outs touting this symposium's first 50 years, but I trust I have said enough that the original editors can rest assured that their initial ambitions have been fully realized. In closing, two salient points from the editor's original statement. First, an admission by them that the initial efforts were, quote, necessarily experimental, close quote. That was a generous green light, I think, for succeeding generations of law journal editors to be free to adapt the project's format, as I've shown they did, and to improve upon it as I know they have. Second, the editors expressed regret for, quote, the inadequate treatment, close quote, of rulemaking in the first survey, but promised to remedy what they called that deficiency. Well, surely I've shown, I hope, that they succeeded in that, as the symposium published many path-breaking articles on rulemaking. So perhaps now, a half century after the inaugural issue discussed the landmark Wyman Gordon Company decision, 
it, it has to be a bit of DLJ karma that this 50th issue revisits adjudication. You will not be surprised it does so in typically forward-looking administrative law symposium fashion under the bold banner charting the new landscape of administrative adjudication. Under the leadership of my friends Chris Walker, Emily Bremer, and Kent Barnett, I know we are in for a truly informative, thought-provoking, and enjoyable day. So I close. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to call it a toast. I don't know which one of these is my water. <laughs> Someone told me you had a cold, so I'm going to be careful. Uh, <laughs> so let's just... Uh, assume uh, uh, that this is a toast, and I'm, I'm, going to put it, I'm going to put it this way. May the Duke Law Journal's Administrative Law Symposium during the next half century be as successful in enriching our understanding of administrative law and the crucial role it plays in furthering the proper governance of our nation under the rule of law as it has been in the first half century. Thank you very much. All right, we're ready for session one authors and speakers to come up. Uh, when it's time for questions from the audience, the mics will turn on in front of you, so be sure to speak loudly and clearly to them. Well, that, that was quite a tree. Um, I, I, I hope that some of you are kind of marking this down as, you know, 50 years from now, where are you going to do your careers? And uh, <laughs> if you can have half the career that Randy's had, uh, you'll have had a really, really amazing life in the law. Um, I'm really excited for us to kick off this first panel uh, of the symposium on the new landscape of administrative adjudication. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, and this first panel is just a really, really great group of scholars and friends and thinkers when it comes to agency adjudication. Um, we're going to, um, just to kind of give you a quick introduction in the order in which uh, they're going to talk, um, after I give a soapbox speech on why you should care about this, um, Katie Kovacs, uh, a professor of law at Rutgers, will kick us off. Katie is um, a leading scholar on interpreting the Administrative Procedure Act. As she's recently said in an article, she is a progressive textualist, which is refreshing and fun. Um, we'll then hear from Emily Bremer, who's an associate professor of law at Notre Dame, uh, one of the leading um, scholars on trying to figure out what this new landscape of administrative adjudication looks like. Um, then we'll hear from John Duffy, who is the Samuel H. McCoy II Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. Um, I think among many, many, many other things, John is famous for calling out uh, patent, administrative patent judges unconstitutional. Uh, when that article was posted on SSRN before it even came into print, Congress ran and passed a law to fix it. Uh, I think he's going to tell us why they're still unconstitutional, uh, and that'll be fun. And then my dear friend, Matt Wiener, who I wanted to call the acting administrator, but that's of the Administrative Conference of the United States, but I'm guessing that's unlawful uh, because you've been there too long. But Matt has been uh, the vice chair uh, and executive director of the Administrative Conference of the United States. You're going to hear a lot about the Administrative Conference. Randy mentioned this. This is a federal agency that does research on federal agencies, which is always a nice kind of byline or hit line on how large the administrative state is, but it actually does really, really fantastic work uh, looking at how agencies operate. And some of the most recent recommendations and reports have really tried to figure out how to make sense of this new landscape of administrative adjudication. And I'm Chris Walker. I'm a law professor at Ohio State. Uh, I just want to just really, really quickly give you the pitch on why you should stay the whole day and really care about administrative adjudication. Um, when we talk about the federal judiciary, we usually focus on the Article III judiciary. Uh, and there's been a lot, a lot of focus on the Article III judiciary in the Trump administration. In the first three years, uh, the Senate has confirmed 187 judges uh, to Article III positions. Uh, there's been millions and millions of dollars spent on this, hundreds of 
I was going to say hundreds of thousands, but that's probably right, of hours spent by interest groups, including the American Bar Association, to vet and evaluate these judges. When we think about courts, we really think about Article III courts. And what I want to say today is that's, 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 that's not the right focus, that we're fixating on the wrong thing. Uh, we really need to focus more on the federal administrative judiciary. And let me just give you uh, just some kind of stats to give you a sense of this. So if we think about there are 748, I think it's actually 760 now, Article III judges in the United States today, um, there are over 1,900 administrative law judges. Um, so the numbers there are you know, drastically different. These are judges that are deciding cases that deal you know, with Social Security, with you know, a bunch of different topics that we'll get to today. Um, and that's what we kind of call the lost world in the literature or the lost landscape of agency adjudication. Uh, of, you know, these are what the APA says for formal adjudication. Uh, you have an administrative law judge, it looks like a trial, you have a hearing, there are a bunch of different procedures. I think Emily will talk a little bit about that in just a second. That's really missing, oh, some examples. So FCC, Social Security, Securities Exchange Commission, HHS, all use administrative law judges to judge, adjudicate uh, cases that are before the agencies. But the new landscape of agency adjudication, or when the literature, the new, the new world, is much, much, much bigger than that. And kind of give you one example. This is using data that Kent Barnett, who will be on the second panel, did for an administrative conference report. Um, if you're looking at agency adjudicators that are not ALJs, but they still hold hearings as required by statute or regulation, you have over 10,000 more adjudicators. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, we'll hear a little bit, I'm gonna skip that slide, about the diversity of this. Two major ones are immigration, uh, the immigration courts and patent adjudication. And we'll hear a lot about that in our second and third panels. And our lunch panel will actually hear from the heads of both of those adjudicative bodies. Uh, but it's, it's a big world, right? Uh, kind of just give you your pie chart of that. That little sliver there are our Article Three judges. The, the vast majority of adjudicators in the United States today at the federal level are not Article Three judges, they, they, they're adjudicative agencies. And if we want to complicate this a little bit more, and before I get that, um, think about all the amount of time and energy that's been spent on talking about the 187 Article Three judges that have been confirmed in the last three years. I don't know how many of you thought there have been over 260 immigration judges appointed during that same three-year period. That's just one agency. These are judges that are deciding the future of individuals that are presently in the United States or trying to come to the United States, and yet the ABA interest groups, no one's vetting outside who these judges are. And I just want to kind of emphasize as we're talking today, this, these are high stakes issues. Uh, and these judges are really important to structure in our society. And I'll just end by complicating it even more. And we'll hear about this on the last panel with Jennifer Coe's terrific research. And I made this number up. It's not 50,000, it's probably 200,000. There are lots of other agency officials that adjudicate without hearings. Think agency officials at the border that decide whether someone can enter or whether goods can cross the border. And we're talking a much, much, much bigger world than what we have just when we look at agency hearings. And so that's kind of my pitch on why you should stay and pay attention today, why you should invest in this kind of project long term. Because uh, when you think about courts in the United States at the federal level, they really are much more in the agency level. So I'll kind of now turn it down to Katie to tell us why that's considered <coughs> not with the APA. Does that work? Is that kind of what you're gonna say? Great slides, oh. <laughs> as always. Um, I have no slides. I'm Katie Kovacs, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. I always have to add when Chris is here from the State University of Ohio. Um, so my job today is to set the stage for the day um, with some history of our administrative small c constitution, the APA. And you all know the APA was a monumental compromise and the text is super ambiguous. And so most people just throw up their hands and say, well, we can't possibly discern congressional intent here. Um, I say that's nonsense. I think that we often can tell what each side wanted and how they reached the result they did. It takes an awful lot of work to do that, uh, but it's very important work to do because the APA represented a truly significant moment in our history when, as the Supreme Court said, opposing forces came to rest. It was the moment when conservatives 
and the Supreme Court accepted the new reality of delegations to agencies in exchange for procedure and judicial review. And yet, all these years later, the APA has failed to achieve some of its primary goals. Um, so you know FDR became president in 1933 and the federal bureaucracy exploded. Before 1937, the resistance to that was pretty quiescent because the federal courts were still striking down New Deal programs. Then in 1937, when the court began to uphold New Deal programs, the country dipped into a recession and FDR became politically weaker. So the resistance peaked in the years leading up to the US's entrance into World War II with the Walter Logan bill. Um, now conservatives wanted individual rights, which really meant that they wanted procedure and judicial review to slow the New Deal. Um, liberals on the other side, the New Deal supporters wanted efficiency, which really meant that they wanted to implement the New Deal. And the APA became the compromise between those two worldviews. So I wanna hone in for today on three aspects of the adjudication provisions. When formal adjudication is triggered, who hears the cases, and how. And when the Walter Logan bill, full hearings would have been granted on request by any aggrieved person for any agency decision or failure to act. Who? The head of the agency would have designated three individuals, which seems kind of quaint now, um, to be an adjudicatory board. They couldn't otherwise participate in any case or rulemaking. They had to swear to be impartial um, and decide without regard to the agency's decision. And the how uh, would involve evidentiary hearings with cross-examination and a written record, a written decision within 30 days, which I know horrifies the uh, ALJs in the room, and of course, an appeal to the Federal Courts of Appeals within 30 days. FDR vetoed the Walter Logan bill in large part because he thought it would impose court procedures on agencies. He wanted agency adjudication to be prompt and expert and inexpensive and simple. And he thought that the Walter Logan bill was an attack on modern regulatory reform. So he said, I'd prefer to wait for the outcome of the committee I asked the Attorney General to form last year. Well, their report came out about a month later in January of 1941. And on the when question, the liberal majority of the AG's committee saw formal adjudication as necessary only where less formal methods would fail to produce a settlement or where an issue was so important that some other statute already required a formal adjudication. So their draft bill required formal adjudication only where the law required a hearing on the record. And the conservative majority's draft bill was similar. No debate on that issue between the two. Um, as to who, the liberal majority recommended that hearing officers be well paid, I think it was something like $5,500 a year, for seven year terms, um, that they be separated from the rest of the agency and removable only for cause following a hearing. The majority did not favor requiring total separation of functions in all agencies. But the conservative minority emphasized the need to separate functions strictly in all contested cases. And they thought hearing officers should serve 12 year terms. Um, on the how, the, the liberal majority thought that the elements of a fair hearing were pretty minimal. They didn't even think that oral testimony was necessarily required. They didn't think that a written decision was necessary unless somebody requested it. Um, of course, an appeal to an agency tribunal and a court were involved for them. The minority would have required more detailed notice, um, an opportunity to present evidence, a written decision, even to the conservative minority, cross-examination would have been discretionary. Um, and then, of course, an appeal to the court. Well, the war changed the landscape. It brought the two sides closer together. It enabled the compromise that became the APA. So the ABA administrative law section, which was formed in 1933, 
um, at, at the horror of FDR becoming president. And by the way, footnote, um, all of you can become, you law students can become members of the ABA and the administrative law section for free, so do it. Um, <laughs> we're very cool. Um, the, the ad law section drafted a bill that was submitted in Congress two weeks after D-Day. And it was designed as a compromise. But notably, it was written by one of the conservative members of the AG committee. So it actually adopted more of the conservative minority bill. On the when question, the ABA bill would have required formal adjudication whenever another statute required an administrative hearing. It didn't include the words on the record. As to who, the hearing officers would be removable only for cause after a hearing, they would enjoy a fixed salary, and of course there would be separation of their functions from other functions of the agency, the prosecuting function in particular. On how um, adjudications would work, um, there would be notice, no ex parte communications, um, cross-examination would be allowed on request, a written record would be the sole basis for decision, decisions would have to be in writing, and then of course there would be appeals to the agency and judicial review. It wasn't until June of 1945 that the Senate Judiciary Committee changed the when the trigger for formal adjudications at that point became um, when a statute required a ter determination on the record after an opportunity for agency hearing. But there was no indication that Congress meant any big change there. Um, it was that November of 1945 when they changed cross-examination to such cross-examination as may be required for a full and true disclosure of the facts. Now, the House and Senate Judiciary Committee majorities would have preferred a, a stricter bill. And so they interpreted the new APA to impose new strict requirements on agencies. The administration, now the Trump administration, took the opposite view. And that liberal view was encompassed in the Attorney General's manual. Um, but even there, in the Attorney General's manual on the when question, the AG's manual says that adjudication is generally on the record. So the APA should normally apply, except in run-of-the-mill cases where no hearing is required at all. So that should set things up for the rest of the day. Now, two last observations while preparing for this symposium, and, and by the way, I super duper appreciate the invitation to participate. It would be a great day. I, I noted that Congress really failed to achieve two of its primary goals. One was uniformity. Now, this was more of a conservative concern than a liberal concern, but both sides of the debate supported the move away from the Walter Logan bill's numerous exceptions for particular agencies. Both sides agreed on the when that formal adjudication should be triggered when a statute required a hearing. And Emily, I think, can explain better than I how we got from that apparent consensus to our current mishmash. The other big goal that I think Congress has failed, uh, that, that the Congress of 1946 failed to achieve was the avoidance of isms. Um, so from the early days, the rhetoric around administrative reform reflected a fear of totalitarianism and authoritarianism, communism, fascism. Um, it really permeated the debate. And again, it was more of a conservative concern, but the American public shared this fear that the US would become a Marxist dictatorship. And the fear was not just about FDR himself, but about bureaucrats disrespecting Congress and the courts and the public. And the war only made that fear worse. And yet here we are on the brink of autocracy. Uh, there's not much in the APA's history about the president. And it's not like the Congresses in the 30s and 40s weren't aware that presidential authority posed a real challenge. They created independent agencies. They rejected FDR's request to reorganize the executive branch. But that concern didn't leach into the debate on administrative reform very much. Even in the age of FDR, it seems that they didn't 
really anticipate the unitary executive. And they didn't seem to anticipate that both Congress and the courts would abdicate their responsibility to check presidential power. And so with that totally non-controversial statement, <laughs> um, I think I'm turning things over to Emily. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to try to fast forward a bit and talk a little bit about what adjudication looks like today. Um, but I'm going to do so by beginning with a larger frame so that we can understand where adjudication fits in with administrative law as a whole. Um, and in describing uh, the current descriptive and normative account of what administrative law is, what it does, and, and how it operates, I'm going to be echoing a lot of the same principles that, that came out in Professor Kovacs's discussion. Um, we like to think about administrative law today as a quasi-constitutional body of law uh, that creates uniform, cross-cutting norms that apply across all agencies, um, and that takes as its sort of backbone a super statute, which is the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, and this model of administrative law generally has been built largely using uh, examples drawn from rulemaking and from judicial review. And in those contexts, the narrative really has very strong force. It seems like this is a sound account of rulemaking and of judicial review. Um, but oftentimes in these discussions, in, in constructing this model of administrative law, adjudication is absent. Um, and I say this as someone who started off working in rulemaking and started off studying rulemaking and then got drug into adjudication and found myself in a, in a completely different world. Um, I mean, the reason why adjudication or at least one reason why adjudication is often left out of this overarching theory of administrative law is because it doesn't fit. Um, in administrative law, uh, there are very few cross-cutting norms, very few agencies uh, adjudicate under the Administrative Procedure Act. Congress has routinely, starting mere years after the APA's adoption, uh, created specialized procedures for agency adjudication, routinely ignoring the Administrative Procedure Act. Courts have, over the decade, uh, decades, moved towards a more deferential posture in which they are largely unwilling to enforce the APA's procedures uh, in, in adjudication. And agencies, for their part, have used their increasing uh, procedural discretion to avoid adjudication under the APA. Uh, and so the world in which we find ourselves is one in which adjudication is just fundamentally different from rulemaking and from judicial review. Um, although it may, these, these rules still may have quasi-constitutional character, they mostly don't come from the APA, and there's just exceptionally wide variety in the procedural rules that different agencies use to adjudicate in different programs. Um, and as, as Chris's remarks showed, I mean, we're talking about a very large category of agency action, hundreds of programs, millions of cases every year. Um, and so to have such variety in such a large universe poses significant challenges. Um, now, I've described, at least in broad strokes, how we got to that uh, outcome. Um, and one thing that I personally find somewhat troubling is that although Congress and courts and agencies have all contributed to the development of this reality, a reality where exceptionalism is the governing norm of adjudication, every agency is special and exempt from the APA's general requirements for adjudication, um, that decision hasn't been made deliberately. Right? It's been made incrementally and in little tiny pieces as opposed to through a process of deciding whether it's a good thing to have a norm of exceptionalism to govern adjudication. Um, and so my general thesis, uh, and as I have looked more at adjudication, I've increasingly come to the conclusion that the exceptionalism norm is not desirable um, and that for both individual agency purposes, but particularly from a systematic perspective, from a systemic perspective, the exceptionalism norm should be abandoned and our institutions should move towards a regime that looks more like rulemaking or judicial review, where there are minimum procedures that apply across all agencies um, and that agencies are still allowed to have substantial latitude to tailor, but to tailor above those uh, universe, universally applicable minimums. Um, and the, the reason that I come to this conclusion is through uh, a sort of cost-benefit analysis, which is a thing that's just inescapable in administrative law. 
Um, find yourself doing it, whether you mean to or not. Um, and there are just a lot of costs that are associated with exceptionalism, many of which I think have not been given adequate consideration, largely because they're systematic consequences. They're costs that um, don't uh, impose themselves on the individual institutions that have been making these decisions, but that accrue through the course of these uh, decisions. Um, now, one obvious potential cost of allowing every agency to sort of do what they want is that you might end up in a situation where agencies are not observing minimum procedural protections that maybe would uncontroversially be recognized as necessary minimums. Um, and if you look at some of the data that the administrative conference has recently produced on the procedures that are actually observed in these adjudications, there's good reason to think that there are some of those minimum procedural protections that are routinely not provided. Um, so to give as one example, ex parte communications, um, that, uh, which uh, Professor Kovacs already uh, mentioned, I think it's uncontroversial that in an adjudication, you don't want the judge having conversations off the record with one party in the, uh, without the other party being present. Ex parte protections are provided uh, in judicial proceedings and are part of the APA's adjudication procedures. Um, but we know from ACUS's data that at least 43% of agencies do not have prohibitions on ex parte communications in their, uh, in their adjudicatory hearings. Um, and so that is just one sort of example of a, of a case where we can have some confidence that there are minimum procedural protections that are not being provided. Now, another more, uh, another sort of more difficult to get your hands around problem of allowing such procedural variation is the possibility that where you have increased procedural discretion, you, you also increase the latitude for agencies to make substantive policy choices under the guise of procedural decisions. And it's, I could give you some examples. There are some interesting ones that come from the, uh, from the Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, context, which we can talk about in the, in the commentary. But one of the hard things here is that this is exactly the kind of harm that's very difficult, by definition, to pin down and to identify. Because the whole point is that these are substantive choices, choices being made in the guise of procedural protection. They um, sort of, by their nature, are difficult to identify. Um, there are also some efficiency costs, uh, allowing or forcing uh, all agencies to kind of labor independently in their procedural design, puts them in a position where they don't have access maybe to useful information from the experience of other agencies. Um, because there's no general cross-cutting requirements and no centralized review from the courts, you don't have a body of case law as you do in rulemaking that all agencies can look to to help uh, resolve the, the common procedural issues that arise uh, in adjudication. Um, and then there are some issues, and I'll be happy to talk about this also more in the, in the commentary, in which there are just special needs of a quasi-judicial proceeding that occurs in an administrative context. Uh, matters that the APA is sensitive to, um, and that if you're not sensitive to, it's easy to adopt rules that imperil the integrity of the administrative state by ignoring those sort of special needs. Um, and there are examples of situations uh, in, in which that cost uh, has surely been suffered. Now, on the other hand, there are obviously benefits of exceptionalism. Um, allowing agencies this broad flexibility to tailor their procedures allows them uh, to tailor their procedures to suit the needs of their individual agency and regulatory program. Um, and this has obvious individual uh, benefits for those individual programs, and it also could have system-wide benefits as well. Um, if you don't allow agencies some procedural flexibility, then there's not an ability to innovate, to experiment with new procedures, um, and to improve procedures system-wide over time. Uh, so that's a thing we might also be concerned about. Uh, now, finally, there's there's one potential uh, benefit of, uh, of of exceptionalism that warrants mention, and that you might get different mileage out of depending on your sort of broader commitments. But one effect of the exceptionalism norm in adjudication is to shift procedural design choices to agencies and away from courts and Congress. Um, and if you believe that agencies have a comparative institutional advantage in creating their procedures, in running their programs, and you're concerned about problems like the ossification that is often complained about in the rulemaking process, then this might be viewed as uh, an obvious benefit. Um, on the other hand, of course, 
the exceptionalism norm is so extreme that it really embraces this idea of exception. I mean, the exceptionalism norm says we want specialization virtually at all costs. Um, and so my basic thesis, and I'll end here, is that it's just too much specialization. Um, we shouldn't want absolute uniformity, um, but at least with respect to the most fundamental of procedures, there should be uniform cross-cutting norms that are centrally enforced, and above which agencies are given the latitude to tailor their procedures to meet those needs of specialization. Um, and with that, I will end. All right, John. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm John Duffy from the University of Virginia. It is the state university also of, oddly enough, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, <laughs> So we have three, we have a majority of state university professors here, which is great. Um, so I, I, I wanted to talk about two things. Chris said one thing that I, I think is interesting and, and is about the constitutional crisis that continues to dog agency adjudicators at the, um, at the patent office, which I think is, is, is really fascinating and has, and has a lot of legs to, um, for other agencies too. I wanted to start also with, I think, uh, re what really is a, a comment on Emily Brammer's excellent paper, which is going to be published as part of this symposium, because my task was to talk about constitutional issues and uh, obviously the appointments clause, something I will get to. Um, but I want to begin with um, talking about what I think is the, the constitutional basis for diversity in administrative adjudication, which is, I think... Uh, maybe to just give background to your paper a little bit more, maybe it's just an expansion of footnote 205 in your paper, <laughs> as it turns out. So I'm playing, you might think I'm playing small ball here, but it, it is actually, I think, something that uh, needs a little background to understand why there's such diversity. And I do think that it comes out of the Constitution. So Emily began by saying in her, in her oral comments here, and in her paper too, she talks about uh, consistency and that the APA was intended uh, to provide, and that was also a, uh, a theme of Professor Kovacs's uh, a discussion. Um, in rulemaking, I think, is your, your, your sort of poster child for adjudic uh, uh, pardon me, not adjudicatory, but uniformity at the agency level. And, and I agree with that. But the interesting thing there is that the, uh, there's also uniformity with respect to the constitutional requirements. They're zero, basically, <laughs> basically. Now I say basically because for those students out there who are taking ad law, here's a little tip for you. Under the APA, as we all know here on this panel, a rulemaking can be something of general or particular applicability. So yeah. be careful on your law school exam because devilish professors sometimes insert this question or this issue <laughs> my hand up too to law school exams, which is you put in something that's a, a rulemaking of particular applicability and you do just sort of notice and comment. You comply with the statute, but you basically are giving short shrift to the constitutional. That's really mean. I know it's really mean. So that's why there's actually a majority of students in the audience, like be aware of that thing. <laughs> But basically, that is a law school hypothetical. I think we can all agree because it, it basically almost never happens or maybe even never happen, has happened. Um, so rulemaking, you can basically say, at least general rulemaking, which is what the agencies are usually concerned with, there's, there's consistency. There's uniformity at the constitutional level, which is zero requirements. And also, I don't think that there was a strong historical development associated with uh, rulemaking procedures. Rulemaking procedures are, are, are more like executive orders that just come down from on high, and they're sort of rules about how things work. And, and maybe there was variation, but there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of, um, uh, 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 of tradition about how things work. With respect to the Constitution in adjudication, I think we can look at Matthews versus Eldridge, and that's why I picked out you know, that paragraph that you have with footnote 205 in it. Matthews versus Eldridge, for those of you who've, who studied it, for you students who studied it in constitutional law or in, um, in administrative law, where I teach it, comes right after, in most law school books, very soon after Goldberg versus Kelly. And I remember as a student reading those two cases and thinking like, 
okay, two benefit programs, government benefit programs. One is sort of run by the state and the other is run by the federal government, but they're basically, you know, government's giving out money. And then you read it and they come out with opposite results. Um, and, you know, Goldberg v. Kelly says, well, you have to have maybe cross-examination and you have to have oral testimony and you have to allow all kinds of things. And then you get to Matthews versus Eldridge and it's like, written's fine, everything else. And, and the court has its distinctions, right? Like if you're a good law student, you're like, oh, well, yeah, most of this is medical because it's social security disability, which is based on medical condition rather than financial condition. So it's more susceptible to these uh, to to written to a written record and doctors and other things like that. And you're thinking like, okay, maybe, but it's kind of you're slicing the salami really thin here. Throughout that opinion, you know, like Social Security disability payments are not are not um, are, are not means tested. So, for example, if your law professor suddenly becomes incoherent or more incoherent. Um, <laughs> That person could get a disability payment, even though he or she has a relatively healthy bank account. That person would, would still be subject to so, so you say, well, yeah, that's true. But a lot of people who are in Social Security disability payments aren't law professors. So you think, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of you know, that's true. The court, what the court's saying is sort of true, but it really does seem like some awfully thin distinctions to generate rather, rather large procedural differences. And so I think that that is an engine that has produced over, over the years. And it's not just Goldberg versus Kelly or and Matthews versus Eldridge and that pair, because you might say, well, that doesn't explain the historical variation. But I think there are norms of due process that have existed in our system forever. So one of the areas I especially pay attention to is the patent system. And for example, I've read the entire legislative history of the 1836 Patent Act, which was kind of a cool thing, has lots of cool things in it. But one of the interesting things is they really cared about due, what, what we would call due process, but they just called process, or sometimes they did call it due process. And they, they put in all these procedures to, to, um, for people to appeal and things like that. So these go back a long, long time, and they are tailored to the interests at stake and to the other institutions that are um, uh, that are involved. So the sort of Goldberg, pardon me, the Matthews versus Eldridge balancing test, and that's the sort of major holding of the of the case. That's been going on, I think, for a long time, but it leads, it's an engine of diversity, I think. And that's something that I think we have to recognize. I have a little bit of a comment on that. I'm not, by the way, I'm not totally opposed in any way for your, I, first of all, I think the paper's great, and I, I, I'm not opposed to the general thrust, but I think the engine of um, of diversity here, both in modern law and historically, is, is something that we have to uh, take account of. Um, and also, not only that, but there also are special constitutional rules. Just the agencies that you covered, immigration, for those of you who study constitutional law, that has its own set of constitutional cases outside the due process area that talk about the balance between due process and, and, and sort of control of the border, sovereign control of the border. That's a special sort of wild card that's thrown into those cases, which affects the adjudicatory procedures. Patents, too, have a very special system. Federal employment or the mine safety structure, those are rather different. One is employment, one is actually imposing fines, which is a relatively modern thing to do, to have an agency actually put a fine on somebody as opposed to just determining whether they're entitled to employment. So I think there's some really big underlying constitutional diversity here, which, which, which may generate um, um, some, some substantial degree of diversity. And I think one thing that you can see that in, in civil litigation, you talk about the diversity in civil litigation. I think that's right. The civil, lit is a, civil litigation, even though it looks uniform with the federal rules of civil procedure, there are, and you, you acknowledge this, there are diverse subsections of that. And so, for example, there's special patent rules that a lot of federal district courts have published special patent rules just for adjudicating patents. Um, but there's also the, the criminal rules of procedure. So where there's this extra consti special constitutional considerations, we do see di diversity. We see the, the, there are separate trial rules for criminal law and for civil law. Now, at the appellate level, there's uniformity there, but that I would analogize to the uniformity that we see on judicial review. That, that really it's easier job to do uniformity at judicial review. The Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals have really one set of rules 
that deal with that. So I think that that's important. And finally, one last consideration of, of creating uniformity. I don't think this really impinges your, your, uh, your project because I think it is not trying to do this. But one consideration we have to give is separation of powers. And the more you make these entities look the same, the more you bring up uh, Justice O'Connor's nightmare in Shore, where she says, if we create a phalanx of non-Article III adjudicators that are really taking over the business of federal trial work, that that would be a problem. Now, many sort of law professors say, uh, particularly conservative law professors say, well, that's what we got. They're just sort of specialized. They're sort of balkanized. But the more we make them uniform, the more we make them look like that phalanx. They're all standing, a phalanx, after all, stands together, right? So they all stand together. So I think that's actually another consideration about this. Now, that's all sort of the constitutional principles that I think push against uh, uh, or push for diversity and, and, um, and, and, and are, you know, some things that you're, that you're pushing back on, which I like. I want to now say, and I, I won't eat up my time. I, I, I probably already eat up my, you, you, you feel free to use the hook, but I'll just say one thing. I'll just give this example at the patent office where I think there, there is a case for uniformity because the patent office has now twice walked into constitutional problems with its adjudicators because the, the Constitution, because they haven't really paid attention to the Constitution. The Appointments Clause of the Constitution is actually a really wonderful example of uniformity, not just uniformity for adjudication, but uniformity for decision makers in the federal government. I mean, I love the Appointments Clause. It really helped me in my career because I had this <laughs> one thing that got me an entire story, an entire page long story in the New York Times about one little blog post. Like, what are the odds on that? But the, the, the Appointments Clause is great because it gives uniformity. You can tell students, look, any federal decision maker who's not elected in the federal government, if they have power, there's only four ways, and you know, memorize them, only four ways, four ways, and only four ways in which they can get their power. The president the, with the advice and consent of the Senate, and then the president alone, the heads of departments or the courts of law. They're really simple to memorize. And those final three have to be inferior officers. And that's, you know, that's what's going on right now. The first constitutional crisis, the one I d identified, which Congress fixed relatively quickly, like within light, you know, light speed, warp drive, because they had this constitutional problem, was they weren't using any of those four methods. And that's really easy. Now they're using one of those four methods. They're appointing these adjudicators by the heads of departments, but there's a really serious question of whether they're inferior or not. And that is a big issue that, that has lots of, uh, lots of ramifications for many, many agencies. Um, but there is a one really good example where you can have and should have uniformity and the patent office's deviation from that, which has its own sort of long and sorry history about it. Um, that is something where I think, you know, there should be a push for uniformity as well as other things. I think, you know, we, and hopefully in the question and answer period, we can talk about other places where there should be uniformity. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I think I can actually abbreviate my remarks here a little bit, both to allow for more exchange among the panelists, and I don't know if we're taking questions from the audience, um, but also because uh, uh, Professor Duffy just very well articulated um, my, my views on um, diversity within um, the administrative adjudication state. Um, I don't like autobiography, but let me just respond. Let me just start with a, a small piece of autobiography since Chris declared me unconstitutional. Unlawful. Unlawful. <laughs> Unlawful. Uh, and maybe, that's a, maybe that would be a good seg segue into just explaining very briefly what the Administrative Conference of the United States is, ACUS as we sometimes call it, and what it does and how what it does bears on administrative adjudication. Um, I have trouble explaining what ACUS is to most people, so I usually just content myself, as in the case, say, with my mother-in-law, who's probably watching Fox News now, uh, with the observation that uh, Justice Scalia was the third chairman of the Administrative Conference of the United States, your, your old boss. Uh, he was the chair there for two years until he found a more prominent position to occupy during the uh, this Nixon administration. Um, uh, in any event, um, I, was, uh, I was nominated by President Obama to be the chair of ACUS in 2016, and the nomination never went through because of probably the election of 2016 
And um, um, uh, right at the very end of the uh, Obama administration, I think it was January 19th, I was given a midnight appointment as a uh, as the vice chair, which does not require Senate confirmation. And as the vice chair, I was thereby under our statute, I thereby became under our statute the uh, acting chair. Um, unlike um, uh, William Marbury, I did get my commission from the <laughs> State Department. Uh, you don't need to. <laughs> and you don't need to. That's a very, very good point. <laughs> and the commission process at the State Department could itself warrant a whole symposium, I think. Um, any event, I have been uh, I have been serving as the vice chair ever since, and um, may, there's pr perhaps a number of explanations for that as to why that's the case. Um, some people would say that ACUS is uh, a, a very irrelevant institution. I don't agree with that. Uh, uh, secondly, um, that um, we 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 work in very nonpartisan space, and I think in some ways that's the better explanation. Um, Nonpartisan, the area of nonpartisan space has been constricted in these very divisive times in our politics. Uh, but we do, we do work in nonpartisan space, uh, and we have a diverse membership. And ACUS is, as the name uh, suggests, is a conference. And it's a conference of 101 voting members who come together uh, semi-annually in plenary session and debate uh, and make recommendations about the administrative state, including administrative adjudication. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, uh, four of us on this panel here are members of the Administrative Conference of the United States, and, 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 and Katie will soon get there. <laughs> hold him to that. You, you can hold me to that. Um, in any event, one, one reason I don't think I'm constitutionally, even under Justice uh, Thomas's uh, understanding of uh, Congress's power to uh, allow uh, uh, acting appointments is I don't think ACUS actually exercises or arguably doesn't exercise any executive functions uh, which would require us to comply with the appointments clause. We make recommendations. We have no power. Um, but w our recommendations are very persuasive, and I'll, I hope to <laughs> um, I, I hope to make that point in a, in a second. I would like to I would like to echo the uh, Emily's and John's take about the diversity of administrative adjudication. And even if you talk about adjudication within the APA, that is adjudications that are APA adjudications or uh, uh, um, adjudications in which the agencies follow the APA formal hearing procedures, um, um, there's enormous diversity. Um, the biggest adjudication, APA adjudication program, though it's arguable whether the APA is required to be applied in this context, is the Social Security Administration. So there, there's some like 1,900, uh, two, let's say 2,000 administrative law judges, some 1,700 of them reside at the Social Security Administration. Those are, as Justice Kagan pointed out in a Supreme Court decision last term, extremely informal adjudications uh, by any practical measure. Um, they're not very trial-like in practice. Um, they're largely paper affairs, though there are hearings, and the hearings serve certain dignitary values. Um, there are other agencies, uh, even now, even within, if you, if you were to look at the sort of core regulatory agencies that have the most trial-like procedures, you would still find enormous procedural diversity there. So the, the, the NL, National Labor Relations Board, for instance, which holds very formal trial-like hearings, sometimes very long hearings um, that are as protracted as federal civil cases, doesn't provide any discovery in its hearings, in, in, in its hearing program. The, um, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission does provide for discovery and, in fact, expanded the use of discovery um, in recent uh, regulations. Um, I personally, um, uh, I, I personally, I don't see uh, a need for uniformity in the adjudication system, um, and I don't know that there's a problem to which uniformity initiatives would be directed. Um, I think that probably most of the problems in administrative adjudication are probably do not uh, concern formal legal rules or the design, design of um, uh, 
uh, design of uh, uh, institutional arrangements, um, but rather are problems of uh, management. And um, I think in many cases, um, the w a management and resources. Um, there are many agencies that have tremendous backlogs, um, and these are uh, benefit programs. It take, if you apply for social security disability benefits, um, and these are very vulnerable citizens who are applying for these benefits in many cases, uh, it takes a very, very long time uh, to get a final decision from the agency, and then if you appeal from the agency, ultimately from the courts. Um, and that's a problem. And um, I, I think that my own view is that our reform initiatives in the admi administrative adjudication space should be focused on um, addressing resources and management problems, and in some cases, increasing or trying to enhance the competency of the people who are adjudicating in these programs. Um, with respect to procedural reform, um, I think that there, uh, there is certainly a need for procedural reform. This is an area where uh, ACUS has been very active. And what we do is we make recommendations to agencies uh, uh, after convening all the agencies in our membership, through our membership process. Uh, we, make, we make recommendations for somewhat incremental reform in the administrative state. And many of these recommendations, in fact, are uh, implemented. Um, one of our, I, I'll, I'll mention a few of our recommendations. One of them is recommendation 2016-4, which is discussed in Emily's paper. And what 2016-4 uh, recommends is that agencies uh, observe certain best practices um, in not, not only in APA adjudications, but non-APA adjudications that are relatively formal in the way that they're conducted. Um, so we do in that rec we do in that re recommendation. Um, we urge agencies to have certain prohibit prohibitions on ex parte contacts. Um, we have recommendations that agencies ex uh, observe the exclusive record principle. Uh, we have recommendations in there, and perhaps this is in so we have a recommendation in there that's especially I think important. It sounds small, but it's important is that agencies set forth the procedures that they use in rules of practice that are published in the. Uh, uh, Code of Federal Regu Regulations, or at least put up on their website. But the, f the point here being that agencies should codify their procedural regulations um, and not just not just leave them as unwritten norms. And that's one of the points I think that Emily makes. Let me just mention one other. Let me just mention one other recommendation uh, that we made recently. Um, there's nothing in the APA about in the adjudication provisions of the APA about recusal, um, and um, um, we recently um, uh, promulgated a recommendation urging agencies to adopt recusal, uh, recusal procedures and standards for adjudicators. There are recusal requirements under the, uh, under the federal ethics regime, but they're very limited in nature, and they don't provide a mechanism for parties to enforce, uh, they don't provide a mechanism for parties to enforce the impartiality requirements um, in actual adjudications. They basically just allow a party to go to an ethics office and basically make a complaint behind closed doors. So that's but one. That's just one example of the sort of things we do. And that recommendation in particular is, is actually being implemented now. And um, there are other examples of the sort of incremental modest reforms uh, of the sort that are reflected in, in ACUS recommendations. And we have re had real success uh, on that front. Let me just say one, uh, just, just one last, last thing on procedural reform, um, because I think it might otherwise go unmentioned, unmentioned today. The Trump administration um, did something very, very interesting just a few weeks ago. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget issued a request for information about of administrative adjudication. There are broad set, there are broad, uh, uh, a number of questions, and it, the inquiry seems to be very, very broad. Um, what, um, and there, the, some of the questions that are posed in the request for information uh, take the form of, should the federal rules of evidence 
be uh, applied in administrative adjudication. That's an issue that goes back to the founding of the APA. Um, is there adequate due process for uh, respondents? Um, and I think that really means in this context, regulated parties in administrative adjudications. Well, the interesting, the interesting question that this executive order raises is um, what, not executive order, this request for information raises is what's going to come out of this request for information. And as I read, my, the, my best guess sort of reading the tea leaves here is that we are going to see an executive order from the administration um, relating to administrative adjudication. Um, I don't know what exactly it's going to say. Um, and and a, a one interesting question that is no doubt going to come up, because I've already heard a lot of buzz about this in academic circles, is whether the president has the authority to dictate um, certain administrative practices uh, in, in admi administrative adjudication schemes. Um, if, for instance, uh, very hypothetically, the president said all, adju all adjudications or certain adjudications must obs observe the federal rules of evidence, would the agencies be obligated to comply with that mandate? I don't know if it's going to look like that, um, but it will be very interesting to see what this executive order has to say. I am not aware of any such presidential intervention in administrative adjudication uh, ever. Um, obviously, the president has a big hand in rulemaking through the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs and other uh, presidential control or um, uh, guidance on um, the rulemaking process. But I haven't seen this in the adjudication on the adjudication side, and it will be very interesting to see uh, what comes out of it. Last point here on reform. Um, there may well be adjudication systems that require congressional attention uh, on an on a agency by agency basis. Um, Congress always has the potential to mess things up real badly, but there probably are adjudication systems uh, that could require some uh, congressional attention. Maybe the immigration system, which you'll hear about later, is one of them. Thanks, Chris. Great. So we've got we've got way too much to talk about. Only fifteen minutes to to talk about it. Are there any panelists that want to kind of respond or interact before we do some moderated? Katie, you kind of jump want to jump in or? Well, I I, I think it's <laughs> you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm I'm thinking about the value of uniformity for its own sake, and having practiced in all of the federal courts of appeals. The federal courts of appeals are pretty uniform, and yet some of the courts have their own freakish little rules, and some of them make up rules as you go along. Federal Circuit used to bounce our briefs all the time for whatever reason the clerk wanted to make up on that particular day. So I do think that there is a value in uniformity for people who have to interact with the government um, just for its own sake, because there's a real cost. But in this circumstance, we're not really advocating for uniformity just for the sake of uniformity. It's advocating for certain minimal procedures that I think we probably all agree um, ought to be provided in almost all cases. Like a prohibition on ex parte contact seems pretty basic. Um, some separation of... <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and in circumstances where it doesn't make sense, their Congress could carve out an exception, but um, not having the person who investigated and prosecuted the case making the decision. Um, some minimum standard for reliability of the evidence, um, you know, whether we'd go beyond that to a record rule, publication of procedures. I think the APA already requires that sort of shocking that there are agencies that don't do it. Uh, perhaps recusal rule. I think that there are some basic procedures that we can all agree are what we would think of as fundamentally fair. Um, and, and, and if we want to have a government that has so much power over people's lives, which as a diehard liberal I am all in favor of, I also believe that for that kind of government to be sustainable, there has to be fundamental fairness in the bureaucracy. And I'm not sure that we're really doing that right now. I think that we are interpreting 
the trigger for formal adjudication incorrectly. And I think that the courts tend to, and we all tend to, exaggerate what the APA actually requires. Even the formal adjudication provisions of the APA are really bare bones. There's not a whole heck of a lot there. Um, so if you interpret the APA correctly, it should not impose that much of a burden on agencies. So let's not go overboard and think, oh my God, we have to have ALJs. Well, so hire ALJs. Maybe we're just not um, prioritizing in our government the adjudication of rights that are of benefits and um, licenses and so on that are super duper important to people. I guess I, I, I want to kind of use moderator's privilege to interject there because I, I do think like John's points about the Constitution, I'm all on board with. It, well, maybe not all important. I have to go through everything, but like largely on board with uh, that. You know, we shouldn't constitutionalize everything when like due process itself is. You know, I, I, but that doesn't mean that like getting to what Katie's talking about. We don't want to do this just as a matter of fairness, of a matter of process, not constitutional due process. But like, what should administrative the administrative adjudication look like? And in that sense, uh, um, with Emily's paper and her her work. I would love to see an administrative adjudication bill of rights that Congress, you know, adds on to uh, the Administrative Procedure Act that really fleshes out some of these, some of the examples that Katie was giving, just basic rights that everyone should have when they're being adjudicated. And while I wouldn't say those are grounded in the Due Process Clause, because I, I might view the Due Process Clause as much narrower than probably everyone else on the panel, but maybe John. Um, I do think they are grounded in constitutional concerns about the legitimacy of the administrative state. Uh, more generally, uh, not that they're required, but because we're doing so much of our lawmaking uh, through bureaucrats and not through Article Three judges for ju judging or through Congress and the political branches uh, for legislating, we really have to be much more careful uh, about about doing that. And so I do hope that this executive order that comes out of the OMB process that Matt mentioned does have a Bill of Rights included that says these are things that, even if it's not enforceable, and I kind of think it's not enforceable, I'm not quite a unitary executive theorist, but if it's not, you know, but, but it sets forth some big markers about, about, about that. I want to make one other point about the OMB um, uh, request for information. It is framed in a way to be exceptional. I think they're trying to exclude immigration, and maybe we can talk about this in this last panel, it says how uh, these if enforcement adjudication affects Americans, uh, which is a weird, weird way to frame it. I think it says Americans, not U.S. citizens, Americans, right? Um, if you all are filing comments on this, uh, immigration affects Americans. <laughs> and what American is is a very fluid and interesting and controversial term. I don't think this does exclude immigration at all. Uh, and I think this is kind of one of the one reason why we wanted to have a final panel on immigration is it's not exceptional in a lot of ways when it comes to adjudication, or at least it shouldn't be. I, I get, did I trigger you enough, John, to get you to respond? Or? I think we should go there. <laughs> okay. If somebody wants to ask a question about ex parte, I've got a real Oh, we've got a lot of questions. Anybody, <laughs> but let's say in the audience. Let's go in the back, way in the back, yeah. Oh, that's me, you, yeah. Catherine, hi. Oh, Catherine, uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, Thanks, everybody. This has been a great panel. I guess I have, a comment and a question. Um, the comment is directed toward John, and I think similar to um, what Chris was saying is, the variety of constitutional requirements doesn't necessarily obviate the benefits of having some kind of statutory floor that might be above and beyond what the Constitution would require. And you know, I write in the corner of the immigration world, and the constitutional due process requirements are famously murky there. And I think that it would be helpful to have some sort of statutory floor that wouldn't be so subject to, to ambiguity and debate. Um, my question for Matt is when you said that the problems stem not from a uh, lack of legal rules, but rather from uh, problems with management and resources. 
I guess I'm having a hard time seeing the distinction between management versus legal rules. And I was hoping you could kind of say more about what you mean by management problems that might cure some of the deficiencies we've seen in agency adjudication. Yeah, sure. And I don't want to, um, let me just say this. I, I, while I don't see a problem where, where I don't see a, a system-wide problem uh, of agencies not observing basic procedural norms of the sort we've heard about, there's no doubt that there are specific programs in which there probably are real problems. And the problems in some cases involve um, the way that uh, the adjudicators are appointed and the terms and conditions under which they work, something that I think Kent Barnett will, will, will talk about. Um, what, what I'm referring to, and, and the immigration system would probably be the poster child for all that. What I'm referring to in particular uh, is um, the, um, uh, the need at some agencies to um, move cases much more quickly than they do, and that to me is fundamentally a management problem. And sort of hearkening back to Jerry Mashaw's um, idea of bureaucratic justice, I think there are adjudication systems in which there's, there needs to be a real premium on uh, un uh, uniformity of outcome, it's sort of the idea that like cases should be treated alike. Best example of that would be the Social Security Administration. Um, where you have significant variance in grant rates from judge to judges. Judges, there are judges who grant benefits in 5% of cases and judges who grant cases in 95% of cases. Um, that to me, that is much more concerning to me um, at the Social Security Administration than concerns about the decisional independence of the, of, of, of the, the agency's judges. Um, and uh, things like ex parte contacts, I actually don't even know in that context, in a social security context, which are non-adversarial inquisitorial proceedings which, in which there's really not another party on the other side. I don't even know what an ex parte contact means. Can, can I just, since it was part, part of the question comment was directed to me, I just wanted to say two sort of caveats about the, about the floor, which I, I Generally, I, I agree that I'm open to the project and really open in an honest and, and thoroughgoing way to a floor to, to sort of trying to have more uniformity. Um, but the first thing is I think ex parte contacts are a really good example as to why uniformity may not work. One way to look at the administrative state, which, which I teach my students, is, is that it in some ways a, a, a dose of inquisitorial justice in the American system. We are used to, in our system, in our Anglo-American tradition of the adversarial system. But, you know, if you look at the continent of Europe, and indeed most countries in the world, that's exceptional. That's exceptional. It's instead inquisitorial justice. I mean, look at the way French judges behave. Now, I don't want to live in France, just to be clear. Um, and so I support the American uh, system of, of largely adversarial justice. I really do support that. But some administrative agencies, and in some areas, inquisitorial justice with, with lots of ex parte contacts might be better, might be better. So I think we have to think about that. And finally, the problem with the floor is that if you're, if you're engaged in this cost-benefit analysis, like not the cost-benefit analysis you do in your paper between diversity and specialization or, or uniformity and specialization, but if you're doing it on like the Matthews versus Eldridge cost-benefit, it means that some, some adjudicative decision should be really, really, really quick, way below that floor. If you raise that up, that's very costly. Um, especially if you have a lot of those low-level decisions. So that's, that's something I worry about. But maybe we can come up with a way to, to have that floor not be triggered by these, by, these small, uh, by these smaller decisions. I think actually Emily's paper points some ways to do that, and I, and I, I support that. Can I make just a 20-second comment on that? I, I, I think the floor concept is fine, but you have to, you have to just define, the, you have to identify the domain in which it's going to right. operate. Um, there's just so many adjudications out there, and you certainly do not want to apply the floor, the, the floor principles uh, to all of them. There's adjudications that are so informal that you wouldn't even recognize them as adjudications. Buying pencils. Buying That's, pencils. I, I, uh, I cleared customs uh, last year, and I came in with a, a, a package of peanuts. 
Uh, and the question was, was that an agricultural product under the regulations? Well, I don't think you want all these minimum procedural floors to apply in that kind of adjudication. And I think it is indeed an adjudication. Under the APA, it's an adjudication. So the, the thing that always strikes me is we talk about all of this without even acknowledging that the APA is there. And the APA has a trigger for when the floor of 556 and 557 apply. And it's when another statute requires a hearing on the record. We have a statute to work with. We could try interpreting it and maybe applying it. And, and, I, will, and I will say that? in my paper, I'm focusing only on type A and type B adjudications, which in my view would fall under that triggering. No peanuts. So I'm not talking about the peanuts. But even, even, under the, even under the type B system, the type B adjudication, there are many very important adjudications that are not conducted pursuant to a statute that provides for a hearing. They're conducted under uh, uh, a regulation that has very little statutory mooring, uh, and in some cases, an executive order. Mm -hmm. Making sure there aren't, I always try to prioritize student questions. Okay, we'll have student Stewart if you want to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just interested in uh, how, how, how you identify what the, the priors that lead you to have the conclusions you do about uniformity versus um, versus versus diversity. So I can, there's a lot of different axes here that I can imagine might be in the back of your mind when you're doing your own cost benefit analysis about it. You know, there's there's the old debates. You know, uh, James Landis versus versus Madison. How much do you want to just let agencies operate on their own without having a lot of constraints? This might be part of the rules versus standards debate, right? You like you, you like um, bright line rules. Um, you might think of this in terms of um, limits on presidential power. Um, if you're uh, how excited you are about a unitary executive that really does have power uh, over agencies um, uh, or, or not. By the way, the limits of presidential power can cut either way insofar as you think of agencies as actually really being independent of the president, which is why it therefore implicates the unitary executive debate. It might also be that you think um, if in, in, in a world in which agencies are able to come up with their own rules, Certain groups will systematically get the short end of the stick. They, will, they won't get the, the procedures, and, and more powerful groups will. And so, in fact, having the floor will help those who are otherwise would be the least powerful to be able to advocate for themselves to say, we should have a set of rules. And I'm only scratching the surface. There may be eight others. I'm just wondering, when, when you do your own analysis, what is it that you think is, is affecting how you see those, those costs and benefits and, and therefore how you, uh, how you put it together? So can I? Yeah, it's your so, paper. So. So, <laughs> so I so I start. I have a very practical sort of response to this, which is that I was in practice for several years before going to the administrative conference as a staff attorney, and I did all rulemaking. Uh, I sued agencies in rulemakings. I filed comments in rulemakings. I was you know the staff counsel to the committee on rulemaking. All I studied all the time was rulemaking. And it was so glorious and made sense. And there's this body of case law, and everyone knows what the requirements are, and everyone knows very clearly demarcated the areas where agencies have discretion and places where we can make, you know, have productive debates across agencies that do vastly different things in rulemaking about how to how to how to make choices procedurally. And then um, Matt assigned me to be a researcher in a project on adjudication. And my world came tumbling down uh, because uh, it turns out that the most fundamental principles are, are very difficult to pin down. And there is no body of case law. And there is no body of statutory requirements. And figuring out anything is just profoundly difficult. Um, and I got, I got stuck on it. And I started writing about adjudication. And the more I looked at the system and just tried to figure out what it is and what the rules are and who's making them, uh, the more I realized that something has gone very wrong in adjudication, um, mainly because it doesn't function well the way that rulemaking does. Um, and so for me, I look at this totally as almost a sort of scholar practitioner in the bowels of the administrative state and just thinking that this is something that is very wrong and is, an obs is, is obscured by the fact that there is such an utter lack of uniformity. All right, I want to say something about it. John wants to say something. We're out of time, but we're going to take two minutes, a minute to. OK, so I think my prior is actually, I want to actually point to Emily's paper and one of my old papers to say something I think she hit spot on, which is that you've got diversity and then you've got uniformity. And the way to decide between those two principles is a cost benefit analysis, which you, which you have. I had a, an old paper about unifying patent law in one circuit court. 
called Rethinking Patent Law's Uniformity Principle, where I dealt with this issue in the judiciary about, about doing that sort of thing. And I, my co-author and I ultimately hit on, I think, the same principle that you have, that, you know, as, as Emily said at the beginning of her talk, cost-benefit analysis is everywhere. It's everywhere in our life. It's tort law. It's, it's, it's the executive orders. In, in, and it's here, too. I think that's the right principle, to have a thoroughgoing sense of the costs and benefits they are, it's, it's, a, it's a tough balance to, to, to strike. And I think we often get it wrong, but I think we have to start thinking at this higher level question, which I think your paper does a really nice job of, of doing, of saying, you know, let's think about the costs of benef benefits of uniformity versus diversity. That's my prior, which is a thoroughgoing utilitarian law and economics prior. So I, I'm going to throw a different prior, uh, which is kind of what Stuart said at the end, and I, and I hope. I can convince Emily to frame it more along those lines of the default of uniformity is important for the reason that um, one reason I think exceptional is it's, it's not that you can't depart from a uniform standard, but I want Congress to make that decision. Uh, I, I worry about, I want a floor that applies to everything so that everyone can have certain rights and, 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 and process and adjudication. I want the default to have to be overcome because I see, when I see adjudications, that certain areas the default is overcome very easily by an agency. Uh, and those areas are ones where you don't have sophisticated regulated, regulated entities pushing for, for stronger protections. And so I really think it's much more of a democratic process, default setting approach, to have to force Congress to say, if we're going to treat immigration differently or veterans differently, as they're currently treated in my mind, Congress actually actually vote on that and say, we're gonna give them less rights than we do at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. So I think, Matt, you wanted to jump in? You're gonna- No, I was just gonna say in the context of the veteran system, Congress largely designed the system. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, yeah. And, and to the extent that it's a mess, and it is a mess, it's in, in large, part to, part, large part of the fact that the system, the, the way the procedures work are baked in, baked in the statute the agency doesn't have a whole lot of discretion. Now, I'm not yeah. going out here and saying that the Veterans Administration left with its own devices will do a great job. Yeah. Uh, but that is, fair. That's fair. that is an example where, the, where, uh, where you have um, a statutory design, and to some extent it's true in the immigration system. Um, I, I think that the matter of appointing judges, which is maybe a key problem with that system, is, is also baked into statute. Well, that's fair. So we're going to take a 12-minute break and then come back for the second panel. Yep. Let's thank our first session.